The year is 1944, and the Allies have a problem. Soon, it will become the largest naval invasion in history, an operation that had been planned since 1943, and that already required extensive misdirection and manpower was set to take place. But Allied command had received troubling intelligence reports, saying that there were significantly more German Panther tanks than initially anticipated. The Panther sported a high-velocity 75mm cannon, one of the most powerful of World War II, and front armor that couldn't be penetrated by the M4 Shermans that made up much of the US tank force. With these high stakes, it was crucial to confirm the validity of the intelligence reports, so the Allies turned to their statisticians to solve. At this point in the war, the Americans and British had encountered a measly one Panther tank in Sicily, and the Soviet Union had captured a second Panther on the Eastern Front. Designed to counter the venerable Soviet T-34, the Panther was one of the deadliest tanks an enemy crew could encounter on the battlefield. Given the threat the Panther posed, as interest in the Allies opening the Western Front, the Soviets agreed to hand over the second captured Panther to British and American statisticians. From here, the question they needed to answer was simply how many Panther tanks were being produced in total. However, that was much easier said than done, and the reasoning is obvious. How do you even start to go about estimating the extent of German tank production when all you have is two tanks? But the statisticians had one trick up their sleeve, one that could be found hidden away on almost every piece of Nazi equipment, weaponry, and vehicles. Serial numbers. The Germans, logically, used serial numbers with regular sequences, but the seemingly unremarkable choice would end up being exploited heavily by the Allies. Early analysis of the production of aircraft tires had proven successful. Now, it was time to take on the tougher challenge of tank production. The Panther was constructed with 8 axles and 4 wheels for each axle, making for a total of 32 wheels. Each rubber wheel was manufactured using a tire mold was given a number corresponding to which mold it was made in. Using this, the Russian Panther's tires had numbers ranging from 1 to 9, with each number being represented multiple times. This indicated that there was one plant with 9 molds producing these tires, and there was no need to estimate the number of molds. The tank from Sicily proved more difficult to analyze, with markings from three different manufacturers being found with much higher mold numbers. Each company used different numbering systems, so they have to be analyzed separately. The largest company had a maximum mold number of 77, and with only about 19 tires coming from this manufacturer, the statisticians knew they likely hadn't seen the highest mold number. Therefore, it needed to be estimated. So how would you go about doing that? Well, let's assume that the mold numbers of wheels are in a simple series starting at 1 and going up to the maximum mold number. Because this is unknown, we'll denote this value as n. This series represents all the mold numbers, but remember, we only have our sample of 19 tires. Now we need to find n. The first thing you can deduce is that n is at least 77, because that's the maximum we found from our sample. Clearly, if we have found a mold number of 77, then the maximum of all mold numbers won't be smaller than this. Given this, we use 77 as our starting estimate for n. So now, the question shifts to figure out how much higher we would expect the maximum to be from our sample. In other words, the gap between 77 and n, and minus 77. We're going to make the reasonable assumption that every number has an equal probability of being selected, which in statistical terms means the numbers come from a discrete uniform distribution. As mentioned above, we are interested in the expected gap between n and 77, so it makes sense to try and understand the gaps between the other elements of our sample. We can imagine our sample as a subset of a population series, with the smallest value in our sample has a number of unobserved values below it, and the maximum has a number of unobserved values above it. Given that the probability of seeing some value in the sample is equal to seeing any other value in the sample, it makes sense that the probability of there being a certain number of values below the sample minimum is equal to the probability of there being the same number of values above the sample maximum. 
Further, we would then expect there to be about the same number of values above the maximum and below the minimum. This means that we could estimate n-77 with x1-1, where x1-1 represents the gap between the sample minimum and the minimum of the population. But this reasoning was taken even further, because not only would we expect the gap between sample minimum and population minimum to be the same as the gap between the sample maximum and population maximum, but also the same as the gap between all pairs in the sample. We can summarize this by finding the average gap within the sample and setting this equal to n-77. So we have x1 minus 1 plus x2 minus x1 minus 1, remembering that we subtract by 1 because the series starts at 1 and not 0. We continue by adding x3 minus x2 minus 1, and on until we reach the nth term with xn minus xn minus 1 minus 1. Each of these terms represents the nth gap between the serial numbers in our sample, so to get the average, we simply divide by the number of samples, n. We can simplify further by noticing that each x cancels out except for xn, and then we are left with xn subtract by 1 n times. So this leaves us with xn minus n divided by n, which finally simplifies to xn divided by n minus 1. Now with an estimate of the gap, n minus 77, it is easy to see that we can also estimate n, the highest serial number, by adding 77 to our previous estimate. So, plug in n equals 19 and xn equals 77, we get 80.05. Therefore, it was estimated that the manufacturer of these tires had about 80 tire molding machines. Similar analysis was done for the other two manufacturers, and from here, tank production was estimated by consulting with British wheel producers, and then assuming that a percentage of tire output was for replacements, and the rest was for a new tank assembly. For example, the British producers might say they could produce about 1,520 tires per month with 80 tire molds. So as 20% of tires are for replacements, that means you have about 1,216 tires being produced per month for new tanks. Recall that each Panther had 32 of these tires, so dividing 1,216 total tires by 32 tires per tank means that we'd estimate that 38 tanks were being produced per month from a specific plant. This analysis could be combined for all the plants to get a total estimate for the production of Panthers. While the Allied statisticians could have just taken this estimate alone, when it comes to war, where the margin of error is life or death, accuracy was of paramount importance. The obvious answer to improve accuracy was to make more estimates using other components. However, most of the components were made with serial numbers that were in a complicated series that were hard to estimate. Thankfully for the Allies, one component would prove to be a weak link, the gearbox. The gearboxes on Panthers were found to have a much simpler series. To illustrate this point, let's pretend that after analyzing the gearboxes on five tanks, you have the following serial numbers. Aligning these together, it is immediately apparent that there is a year given in the number, this further leads one to believe that we have a day and a month represented. Germans represent dates as day, month, year. Given that the third and fourth numbers concatenated together never go higher than 12, which leads you to expect that these represent the month, while the first two numbers represent the day. Now moving on to the letters at the beginning, the Germans, in the interest of security, decided to start requiring manufacturers to use a code instead of their name. Fortunately for German high command, the manufacturers did a terrible job. For one, each manufacturer used nameplates with distinctive materials that could be matched with tanks made before the shift to using code names. Additionally, the printing on the nameplates was also distinctive, making it again easy to match codes to manufacturers. So that leaves only the last three digits to most likely represent where the part fell in the series. Now they are able to apply the same estimation procedure as was used for the tires. First, there are at least 226 tanks because this is the highest number in the sample. From here, focus shifts to estimating how much larger we should expect the actual number of tanks to be. This can be done by thinking about how large the gap would be between 226, the actual largest number, which again we'll call n. So the maximum n is in the interval 226 to infinity. Assuming the tanks were captured randomly, it intuitively makes sense that n shouldn't be that far from 226. For example, if n was actually 1000, then the probability of our sample containing only serial numbers at or below 226 be equal to 226 over 1000 to the power of 5 is equal to 0 0.00059. Again, it is expected that the gap we're looking for, the gap between 1 and the sample minimum, are equal to each other. Using the same process as before, 
set expectation of n minus 226 equal to the sum of the gaps divided by the sample size. Now we can fill out the x's with our specific sample values, and we have 5 tanks, so n equals 5. You'll notice, like before, the x's cancel, leaving us with the highest serial number among the captured tanks. So we have 226 minus 5 divided by 5, which is equal to 221 divided by 5, or approximately 44.2. Now we add 226 from the other side to get our estimate that there are a total of 270 tanks. While this is a simplified example, and the actual serial numbers would follow a more complicated series, the math remains roughly the same. Not only that, but this is also the same number of Panther tanks our statisticians estimated were produced in February 1944. What was the actual number of tanks produced, you ask? The Germans' famously meticulous documentation provided the answer after the war, with 276. The great accuracy of these estimates is made only more impressive knowing that the Allies' best spies estimated Panther production to be over 1,000. With a bit of thought, a simple formula, and a few tanks, Allied statisticians were able to beat the best intelligence gatherers. But what would happen if you had captured more tanks? In this case, let's assume that the true total number of tanks is 276. And now, I'll use a computer to simulate capturing these serial numbers without replacement, in the interval 1 to 276. While not always the case, clearly the estimates trend closer to the actual value of 276. With both estimates from the wheels and gearboxes in hand, the Allies were able to cross-check their numbers to come up with a previously mentioned figure of 270 Panthers being produced per month. The intelligence reports had been confirmed, and the Allies then knew they would have to contend with far more heavy tanks on D-Day than they had planned. Indeed, only a handful of Panthers were expected to be encountered. Instead, over a third of all tanks in Normandy were Panthers. The US and Four Shermans that performed well against Panzer III's and Panzer IV's in North Africa were ill-equipped to take on this force of heavier tanks. However, US tank doctrine was slow to adapt to this newly apparent threat, as it was largely controlled by General Leslie McNair. General McNair followed the belief that tanks primarily served to support infantry and should let enemy tanks be taken care of by a separate force of tank destroyers. This led to a lackadaisical effort to upgrade armor units with tanks that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Panthers. The turning point finally came after the Battle of the Bulge in January 1945, where heavy Allied tank losses due to German Panthers led General Eisenhower to step in and acquire only more powerful 76mm armed M4 Shermans, as well as a few M26 Pershing heavy tanks we shipped to Europe from then on. Throughout the rest of the war, accurate estimates of German tank production continued to be important for the Allies. As they advanced towards Berlin and the end of the war, they used their knowledge to plan their strategies and allocate resources accordingly. In the end, the Allies' efforts paid off, as they were able to use their knowledge to help them win World War II. The success of the D-Day landings and the eventual victory of the Allies on VE Day were both made possible, in part, by the work of analysts who worked to solve the German tank problem.